Hello, everybody. Good evening. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? This is uh, Phil Russert. I'm the host of Q uh, Creator Con Q&A. We have another episode with another great artist and writer tonight. And before we do that, of course, we do our plugs. I am the owner and promoter of Creator Con, which is a true com comic book convention where we have our celebrities are the creators of comic books, and we have wall-to-wall -wall thousands of comics. We are on a hiatus right now due to the current situation, but if you go to the under construction website, www.creatorconevents.com, you can put your email in there and be on our email list to get the up-to-date announcements and information on the show. Before we get started with our guests, I do my shout-outs as usual. <clears throat> if you really want some great prices for comic books, go to Mad Titan Comics. It is owned and run by Eric Gunderson. Mad Titan underscore comics on Instagram. <clears throat> and in Eric Gunderson on Facebook, we have lessdudis.com, L-E-S-D-U-D-I-S. -E -S. It's everything you need, pop culture and geek culture. Hey, Gallo, thanks for coming in. <clears throat> so please go to lessdudis.com. We also have toypocalypse.net, which is an eBay store for them. Their website is under construction. They have collectibles and all things that are pop culture, including horror, superheroes, you name it. We also have my local comic shop, Androids Comics, or Androids Amazing Comics. You can go to androidscomics.com or on Instagram, Androids Comics. Great shop with a great owner, Anthony, and his manager, James. James has his own podcast, Androids Amazing Podcast. It's on iTunes, Apple Pods, Google Cast, Spotify, Anchor, and more. Uh, James is very knowledgeable of comics, a uh, very sociable guy. They have interviews with artists and creators. They do book reviews, uh, you name it, and they talk about it. <clears throat> we also have an Indiegogo that is out now. The campaign is going now. It's Tribulation Task Force. Basically, it's a Christian-based superhero team where the Apostle John is alive and held prisoner at the Vatican, and the Tribulation Task Force has to rescue him. It is on Indiegogo now. The link will be put in the chat. Please go support and pledge. <clears throat> we also have a local artist who is very talented, uh, Wade King. If you go to Instagram and Facebook at Art of Wade King, you can check out his drawings. He's open for commissions currently, and he does a live draw on Instagram on a nightly basis. So please check that out. We have Enrique Lopez. He is an inker and artist and writer. If you go to his IG and Twitter accounts, Studio Main EFL, M-A-E-N-E-F-L. He also has his show, Inking with Kike, Q-U-I-Q-U-E. That's every Monday at 9 p.m. He'll ink live with a special guest. He also has his elopezgil.myportfolio.com where you can see all of his artwork. And if you want to buy his new anthology book, Stupendous, you can reach him on Facebook Messenger at Enrique Lopez. So having said all of that, thank you everybody for coming out. Tonight's guest is Livio Romandelli. You may know him as the IDW artist for Transformers, G.I. Joe, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, 30 Days of Night. He's also done covers for Star Wars and Dark Horse, among any, many other things. He also has his creator-owned series called The Kill Lock, which I have to tell you, I read the first issue, and it is fantastic, and the art is amazing. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Livio Raimondelli. Hey, it's a pleasure to speak to you. How's it going? <clears throat> uh, you're frozen. There you oh, go. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, nice to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, man? I'm good. I wish we could be doing this in person somehow, but still nice to see you. Yeah, I agree. The uh, convention scene, unfortunately, we don't know what the future is. Although New York Comic Con hasn't canceled yet, so I don't know what's going on. I can only imagine it's unofficially, you know, I can't see it going forward. I wish it was going forward. Yeah, I don't I don't know what they're waiting for or if they're going to try to do the um, the virtual con like San Diego did or not. But Yeah, I maybe learn from some of the other cons and take the good things and I don't know. Yeah, it's definitely not the same experience. I mean, I've been seeing your cons for years. I've bought a lot of your Star Wars prints, which if people haven't seen them, go to his site. It's, they're awesome, like the Darth Vader one with Hoth in the background. Oh, well, thanks. But um, I think it was like five years ago at Phoenix Con is when I really got to talk with you, and you drew on one of my jams. And then I've just had you on my jam since then. So 
Nice. No, it's been a pleasure. Your jams are amazing. I always feel like I'm holding like the holy grail. The amount of talent you have on those things. By the time I see it, I'm like, oh my god, I don't want to screw up this thing. So, oh, uh, you killed it. I mean, I can't really show you right now, but right behind me, I have an X Men villains one, and you did a Sentinel. Oh and you yeah. Did you did the Cameron Hodge, and you yeah. got the creepiness in his face because I don't know if you know everybody knows the character. He's a creepy character, and you really nailed it. I love it. It's right behind yeah. me. So. No, thank you so much. That was a fun one. Yeah. <clears throat> so getting into your career, obviously you're really well known for Transformers. I mean, you draw them like nobody else. Thanks. But um, when did you start into comics? Like, how old were you? How'd you get in? How'd you break in? So, uh, yeah, I was into comics since I was a kid, you know, um, I was really into Ninja Turtles at the time and then the Marvel Transformers run X-Men. And then I got a little older and I was into like Spawn and Savage Dragon and that kind of thing. Um, I was just loving them my whole life. Uh, my way I got into the industry was really kind of funny. It was very lucky where I was going to art school in San Francisco and I, I always hoped I could draw comics for a living, but I didn't know if that was a viable way to make a living. You know, I didn't know if there'd be a lot of freelance uncertainty. So I was actually studying concept art for like video games and movies. And I would check Jim Lee's Wildstorm blog, Gelato Medi, uh, just for fun. And one day as I was finishing school, they had a job posting to work on the DC Universe Online game as an in-house concept artist. So I was like, huh, because I didn't even check that for a job. I checked that for fun. And I applied and I got hired. So I was very, very fortunate because my first boss was Jim Lee, who was like my hero still. And uh, yeah, and then that really, that that led me into doing comic conventions. So that's when I found, like, I was kind of discovered by an editor at IDW to do Transformers. So I was very lucky. So right out of the gate, you got to work with Jim Lee and on one of the biggest MMO games that ever existed. Wow. Pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it, really? Yeah. I was, I was very, it was very, very surreal because I had grown up on, like, Pennsylvania, the East Coast, and then I moved to California to go to grad school. And that was already a giant shift to move across the country. And then after a couple of years of you living in San Diego and working for Jim Lee, it was very... Very surreal. It, it changed my life for sure. Were you intimidated when you met him, or were you like fanboying, or were you like trying to be professional? And I was very intimidated. Um, he's very nice, and and all the people at Wildstorm. I met them all at one big dinner or one big lunch, so I met everybody at once. Kind of, they were all very very sweet and warm. I was I was also much more kind of shy back then too. So I would I, I think I was trying to be professional, but I was I was nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, no better way to jump in a pool and swim than just jump, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're in. Yeah. yeah. So how long after that did you start working with IDW? I was at a lot of time for about four years and doing conventions. And then, so yeah, about four years and that led right into Transformers. And Transformers has been about 10 years so far of work, which is pretty crazy. You've done a lot of covers and a lot of interiors for them and your work is fantastic. Yeah, thank um, you. I mean, was it a dream project to do Transformers or I mean, like, a huge fan or I was, yeah, I was a huge fan of Transformers. Like growing up, like star Wars and Transformers are probably, probably two things I liked the most. And yeah, I mean, it really felt like an honor. I mean, the first thing I got to do was this best of Optimus prime cover for this trade paperback. And I thought, man, if that's the only piece I ever get to do, that would still be a dream. Cause it's like, as my favorite character and yeah, just really special experience. Well, I have a sketchbook for my show that's Transformers theme that I want you to do Optimus Prime on the cover. Yeah, whatever you want. Uh, yeah, yeah we, I got to get you. I got to get you to the convention, man. I got to have to see you. I know. Maybe 2025 we can do it. for. Yeah, let's we'll <laughs> hope sooner than that. I know. And I also want to get that you. Star Wars jam from you, too. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, still, yeah. I still plan on doing that. So. Yeah. Nice. You should. That's awesome. Uh, Keith Brunswick actually wanted to ask you, what is your favorite Transformer and which one is the hardest one to draw? That's a great question. Um, my favorite is Optimus Prime. Um, the ones that kind of meant a lot to me as a kid too, like Soundwave and Devastator, Megatron. Love Soundwave. Soundwave's awesome. Like he's my right with Optimus Prime. I mean, I love Soundwave. The hardest ones to draw, the ones that have like Ultra Magnus has these huge shoulders and Starscream has giant wings. So they're tricky to draw, especially if you're putting them in a comic book, because they tend to obscure the people behind them, you know? Like, right. if you're Starscream talking about the character, he sort of blocks a lot of what's going on. That That's really tricky to frame. Okay, so that's all angles and everything that you have to worry about. Yeah, and there's a lot of tangents in Transformers, mm -hmm. basically when you're roughing it out. Right. Or going on in detail, and you're like, oh, this antenna goes right over someone's face or something. It's There's a lot of stuff like that. Some people don't know what a tangent is. Uh, I'll, if you want to explain it, go right ahead. Sure. A tangent is basically something that unintentionally distracts your eye. So 
like, you know, an object that's like this in the corner, like some kind of weird angle that you're not supposed to be looking at too much, but it, it sort of hijacks the image. So tangents are bad. It's also like if you have lines meeting of two objects, right, that aren't supposed to be like becoming one line, you want to make sure you differentiate and separate. Yeah. Like if you have, like, let's say you have a character in the foreground and one in the background and they're touching, it looks like they're in the same plane. Like right. that, that stuff. Yeah. It's really, tangents are bad. And they're, and they're hard to avoid if you have a lot of characters in one shot too. Especially with them being robotic. I mean, it's more straight lines and boxes and things like that. I mean, does that make it harder? Yeah, it does. I mean, the transformers are difficult because if you look at the mobility of what a transformers toy can do, you know, like if you ask out, like if you have a toy of Optimus Prime, make it close, like cross its arms, it's pretty awkward looking. You have to kind of give them a little more, you cheat a little bit to make them a little more like expressive. You know, same if you're drawing like Doctor Doom. Doctor Doom is wearing, you know, head to toe medieval armor basically, but he still he still crosses his arms and he has very human gestures, and you have to kind of push that a little bit. Plus, even with his mask, his eyes tell a lot about the character. You have to be expressive. Absolutely. But yeah. I have to say, as much as you're phenomenal at drawing robots, and that's probably what you get the most requests for, you do amazing human figures as well, you know, expression and, and, and things like that and anatomy. So Thanks. don't think he's just Transformers. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, I was actually going to work on this. You want to see it. This is an in-progress Optimus Prime. Beautiful. We're going to ink this while we talk, if you would like, and then it show you at the end. Awesome. And at the end, I mean, you're going to be putting it up for commission if anybody wants to buy it. Yeah, it can be for sale after this. Okay. So, so, so I guess you're not a GoBot guy, no leader one. I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I'm aware of them. I, I think I even had to as a kid, but no, I'm a team Transformers. <laughs> <clears throat> so I know you're 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 a mainstay at IDW. Have you ever wanted to work for the two big publishers? Uh, you know, or are you comfortable, happy where you are? Or? I mean, I, I do. Like, I grew up a huge like Marvel fan. Although I love, I love Batman as well. I, I, I would be all for it. I, the older I get, the deeper into my career, especially after like the Kill Lock, doing an original project, an original character, has been really, really amazing. I love that experience. You know, when you work on uh, licensed characters. Oh, hey, Tony. Uh, when you do licensed characters, you know, you're always you're more limited, you know, in, t in the story you can tell because obviously you're, you're just running with these characters for a little bit like a torch then you're passing it on to someone else. But when you create a series, you can do whatever you want with it. And that that freedom has been really amazing. So, I mean, but I would be all for I mean, I don't I don't in, in my mind, I don't have like an ideal Batman story I would love to tell. But that's not saying that it wouldn't like come later. Who would be your creative team if you could? If you had full reign to pick, who, what character and what creative team would you would you work on? God, and would you do the writing? Because now you're writing very successfully. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know. That's a tough one. There's a couple properties. Like I'm a huge RoboCop fan. RoboCop. So like that's that's a property I would really love to work on. I mean, like I'm I'm a huge movie fan in general too. So like getting Ed Newmyer who like wrote the screenplay to to illustrate a story he wrote would be really cool. In terms of comics, like. Brian Vaughn is a writer I really like a lot. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Um, and then even like novelists, like I don't know if you were, uh, if you watch Gone Girl, but Gillian Flynn, who wrote Gone Girl, she's one of my favorite authors. And I, I don't even know if she likes comics, but I really like her sense of humor and her storytelling. Like I think that would be really cool to illustrate something from her. Nice. But, yeah, but there's so many people in comics, like so many amazing. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of great creative teams. But I'm an 80s guy, so my creative teams are the, the best ones for me are back in that era. Oh, yeah. What was your book in the 80s? What was your main title you were into? I was a big Uncanny X-Men fan. I, oh, uh, Claremont? I that quickly, yeah. Uh, Claremont, Byrne. I mean, before Cla – I mean, I'm not old enough really to have been there live for the Claremont and um, yeah. Cochran, but Claremont, Byrne, to me, was the all-time epitome of, of comics. I remember when Claremont retired – for the first time that was like the closest thing i'd seen in comics like a music like a musician retiring like a real big big right. dude. he was giving up that run but yeah so you were saying star wars before and i know you've done some covers for star wars books um, yeah that that is something i would love to work on more is, is star wars i mean i think it's a little it's a little hard these days because i think that the fandom is such a quagmire you know like it's something you, you almost don't want to step into yeah, that. But you know what? As much as you're a true fan, you might actually save it. You know, you can. And, know. and plus, putting it in the books, if, if, what if you wrote it and drew it? Would that be awesome or what? It would be amazing, but I have no doubt I would do something that people wouldn't like because I have, like, I mean, I have no doubt that J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson are, are gigantic Star Wars fans. I know they are. But even them, like, I'm, you know, 
just going into that like meat grinder sounds pretty <laughs> meat grinder, yeah. <laughs> you might as well be yeah. bullseye. Put it right here on the forehead, right? <laughs> I know. I just think that the it's so it's so hard. I mean, I think when you work on a, an original property like the Kill Lock, you're really not having to compete with what people have thought of these characters for 30 years. You know, you don't you don't they're not assigning their childhood to, in your hands. You're really just telling a new story. And I think that that feels like a much safer space to be in these days, you know, like, <laughs> but so, yeah. as far as Star Wars, who are your favorite characters and what was your favorite movie? Oh, um, my favorite movie unquestionably is Empire Strikes Back. That's just, All my, right, favorite. Yes. Um, that's just my favorite movie. Not even my favorite Star Wars movie. I love right. that movie. Um, yeah. Favorite characters, pretty much the ones featured prominently there, like Vader, Yoda, and Boba Fett are, you know, my, my three favorites. I tend to lean toward the, the mytholo mythological side of Star right. Wars and the, the, the grimy underworld, like the bounty hunter side, more than the Han Solo cowboyish side, you know? Okay. But, yeah, that's why I think Empire is my favorite because I really like the kind of the spiritual side of Yoda, but also the like the Boba Fett side too. I think I think that's a really cool universe. So did you like Mandalorian? I love Mandalorian. Yeah. Yeah, it felt it felt more retro again. It felt Star Wars. I, I really enjoyed it. The second season's come out soon. So I know. I can't wait for the second season. I think I'm so glad that they finished filming during like before COVID hit because that's going to be such a treat for all of us that, that that still gets to go forward, you know? Agreed. Especially if we're missing out on conventions, at least you have something to look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's not so, the optimist in progress. Now this is being inked. So just putting in the rough angles and I'm going to go into shadows now. Now, are you using any straight edge on that or is that strictly you? I'm using a little bit, not on everything, but I am using a ruler for like his, his ears or his antenna, but not on every line. I have that somewhere I've used on every line, and to me, it almost looks too stiff, you know. But but it, it kind of really really varies depending on what I'm working on. Do you ink your own work at all in comics as well, or do you just do the pencils and submit? So I definitely on commissions I ink them. On the comics I do pencils, and then I color my own work. So I go straight into digital. So oh, okay. Yeah, so I scan in the uh, pencils, and I do Photoshop. So the only inking I really do is kind of commissions. So what would you say? There's there's a stigma about digital art that I think people think that digital artists can't do pencil art and there's a stigma against digital artists. Uh, what would you say to that? It's a good question. I mean, it, it really depends. I mean, I do think having a traditional base for like your skill set is really helpful. Like I think, you know, starting the, the foundation stuff and then going into digital is, is much better than just starting straight up in Photoshop. Uh, there's a ton of benefits to still doing art traditionally. Um, I think the lines look better, you know, that's why I don't draw in Photoshop. I just color in Photoshop. Right. And also, um, you know, as you know, like when comic creators have traditional pages, they can sell those pages. So if you're working exclusively digitally, you're losing a lot of money in a year. So, I mean, I, that for me, like I'll never go hundred percent digital. Like I really like the tangible, like, like right now, like I'm using a Sharpie on paper. Like I like the feel of that. Because know, I've known artists that are excellent pencilers, but because a lot of their work is in digital, you know, their prints and everything, people just assume they can't draw. There's this stigma. And meanwhile, uh, yeah, you have to know how to draw even digitally. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's – I mean, well, I can't do it digitally. It would look like a stick figure. Yeah, I mean, it's like – it's not like the photo – it's not like Photoshop. You hit a button and it draws Batman right. for you. You still have to put in all the work. It's just – I think something about anything. I think even I, – I find this when I – when I buy a digital novel, there is something a little bit different than when you remember physically buying the thing, you know, physically going to the store. That something feels a little more disposable about it. But that's just the way we, the world we, you know, we're in now. And then the flip side is the convenience of digital comics, where it's like, you know, at four in the morning, you can want to read something and download an entire run. They, the store might not carry. So, well, yeah. me personally, I, I love holding a book in my hand. I actually am one of those weirdos that sniffs the book because I oh, love yeah. <laughs> smell of a freshly printed book. My wife thinks I'm crazy, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, any, any classic, <clears throat> excuse me, like story, like Dark Knight Returns or Watchmen, I can't imagine just owning those digitally. I really want the prestige book, you know? That's very cool. We have a few questions actually. We'll address. Sure. Gallo asks, what Marvel, DC, or image character that's missing in action would you like to bring back? Hmm. I'm, I'm not really up on my my Marvel DC that much, I will say. Like, uh, like uh, the last thing I read was House of X, which I love. I thought House of X was fantastic. Um, in terms of, I don't really know who's out of action right now. Like, growing up, like, I was a gigantic Venom fan, like the classic Eddie Brock Venom. Yeah. And I feel like 
the, I don't know where he stands now, but the last couple iterations of him were very different than he was. Yeah. That's, a character, that's a character that I thought had a lot of depth. And then over the years, I think he sort of became this like drooling monster that talked about eating people, but that's not how Venom was initially. He was a Thank much you. more complex, like, so, like psychologically disturbing character. You know, I, no, I agree. Absolutely. I, I miss even the aesthetics have changed. Like you said, he's got the, the symbiotic like tendrils and yeah. the big crazy tongue and the, the sharp teeth. And I mean, I remember when Todd McFarlane first drew him and he was he was a big, scary Spider-Man. Yeah. You know, he was, was. Yeah, he was like a perverse Spider-Man. The only change he really made was he grew a mouth. But he 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 had regular feet. Now he has these like claw feet, or at least the, the last couple iterations did. And to me, it's like. They went too far. Like Venom wasn't this dumb monster. He was a much more. I thought there was a much more interesting character there that got lost. But, but in full defense, I've not read what he currently is, so I don't know if he's gone back a bit. Absolutely agree. So far, what three for three? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, famous artist Geraldo Borges, which will be on my next show. Ask oh, which artist do you have as personal reference for your work? Oh, great, great question. Um, there's there's quite a few. Like there's there's guys that really influenced me. Growing up, like uh, Jim Lee and Todd McFarlane, I love. Like, I don't think my style now looks like theirs, but that, they, they had a huge impact on me. Uh, Alex Ross was someone that really blew me away. The idea of coloring my own work was really oh, kind yeah. of brilliant. I saw how much how much controlling the colors affected your 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 work, you know. So I remember trying to duplicate what he was doing with markers, even though he was using uh, like paint, the gouache at the time. And I was like, man, this I have to learn how to paint a little bit because he's getting these amazing atmosphere to his work that I, I can't do with markers. Right. And then and then I'm a big movie fan. So like uh Ridley Scott and David Fincher, like the lighting that they put in, I I study that all the time. Like I the like Blade Runner and that, that's like my Bible. I, I love studying the lighting in that and trying to bring some of that atmosphere in. I, I you know, I have to tell you, even if I could figure out anatomy, finding shade and light sources, I don't know how you guys do it. It's 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 tough. Especially if there's more than one light source. I mean, speaking of Geraldo, he even he showed one time Green Lantern with his ring and there was a, a light behind him and I didn't even think about the light coming off of the ring and how it goes up your hand and your arm and displays on his face and chest. And you have more than one light source now that you have to capture. Um, you know, and it, it, whether you're inking it or not, you're still setting it up for the inker, whether you're doing the X's or just shading lightly yourself. I don't know how you guys do that. I mean, there's definitely, like I was talking to Alex Sinclair, who's known for as Jim Lee's colorist. And he was, he was explaining how he colors something. And he was like, oh, I use secondary lighting, tertiary lighting. And I was like, man, this is like, <laughs> this is another level of stuff I need to study. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why Jim Lee loves to use him all the time. Well, sure. right? And he's an amazing artist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we also have – oh, uh, Keith Brunswick wanted to know what you felt about the new Transformers cartoon on Netflix, which I just watched and I liked a lot. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. Like I loved um, I loved the edginess of it, you know, and I, and, and for me personally because I drew the Transformers all – when I draw them, I tend to draw them scuffed up and dirty and right. worn and it, it, it felt like my kind of world to me a bit. Like I – the last few Transformers animated series, I liked them, but this one felt more kind of my – visually my aesthetics, you know? Right. Um, and I have friends who worked on it, so I was hearing things internally about, you know, the, the writing, and they were going to try and push the envelope. So I'm, I'm really curious where it goes now because it's, I guess there's two more coming. So. I, uh, I thought that they fleshed out Megatron a little better too. He kind of reminded me of Zod from Man of Steel, where, um, in his mind, he thought he was doing what the planet needed. Obviously, it, you know, it's not, but the gray area of the character writing I thought was was much more interesting for him. Yeah, I think so too. Like we actually did a story in IDW that it felt similar where we did like an origin of Optimus and Megatron's falling out. And and in it, uh, Megatron was much more of like a political leader where he was trying to save the civilization, not just destroy it. And he just kind of went, you know, overboard. But but yeah, so those themes I think are really cool because I think in the original G1 cartoon, they're just sort of at war, you know, but the, yeah. the, new, the new IDW stuff and the new series gets into the underpinnings of, you know, the Autobots may not be the most benevolent force out there, that kind of thing. The things are a lot more gray. So, yeah, I love that. Um, no goofy questions, Steve, at all. But is there something that Levio thinks is missing in Main Street Comics now as opposed to years past or something that he wishes would be addressed or changed in the mainstream industry? Don't hmm. put him on the spot. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say any controversial. You're just not upsetting all his friends in the industry. <laughs> I know. I don't know. That's a good question. Like, truthfully, like, 
I don't read like the, uh, most of the stuff I read now is kind of I'm rereading stuff that I loved back in the day. I was just rereading re some preacher and like uh, I don't I don't read a ton of new books at the moment because I was so focused on kind of making the kill lock and working on Transformers that like House of X was something I heard so many people talk about that I was like okay I'm really gonna gonna buy that and I loved it. But um, it's a good question. I think I think we're in a good place in terms of the amount of diverse creator owned books that are out there now. I think is amazing. Like. I just did a cover for a, I can't say what it is, but I did a cover for a boom studios book that's coming out. That is a really awesome concept. It's an original sci-fi series. And I thought the art inside looked amazing. So I think it's sort of a golden age of a lot of different creators being able to put their original stories out there. So for me, I'm kind of more leaning toward that, that market right now is like the, like, I think when I was, when I was younger, indie books meant more like kind of navel gazing, low, low budget subject matter, you know, and I think nowadays a uh, creator and indie book could be this huge space opera, like so like Saga, which I love Saga, um, like that kind of thing. And I think it's amazing. Like I, I, I would have killed for that years ago. So I yeah. agree. Um, in a second, I want to get into the kill lock, uh, but we have, do you have any personal challenge art wise currently something new or out of your comfort zone you'd like to try? That's a great question. Yeah. So, um, Here's an update on the Optus, by the way. Now I'm moving into some shadows here. By the way, the person that asked that question, she's an also amazing artist, and she drew RC for me in one of my sketchbooks. Oh, nice. And, yeah, great. she was so good. If you ever need an artist for to help out on IDW, <laughs> you got to contact her. She's really top notch. But nah. anyway, sorry about the plug. But <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a great question. Um, yeah, for me, because I spend so much time working on science fiction stuff and robots. Human beings actually are something that I'm trying to get better at doing. Is uh, I'm working on a project now that has a lot of people in it, and for me, that's that's very different. You know, to have humans talking and interacting, and I'm used to robots doing that, but but that's definitely out of my comfort zone because sometimes you find the reverse. You see people that are very good at humans that do not want to draw transformers or any kind of robots. Right. So, yeah, yeah, I would imagine the anatomy just changes everything. Yeah, and also like the um a human face you know there's there's sort of a different skill set for drawing that than there is optimus prime's face like right. like i really love like we were talking about dr doom earlier that his, his his face doesn't move but you get a lot out of his eyes but what his emotions are and optimus prime is very similar I, and i like those characters a lot like that that kind of thing where the way you like frame their head or tilt them that's a lot about the mood you know we were talking about megatron and his character development and you were just talking about expression now you have obviously you create your own series, The Kill Lock out. It's a six issue series. I have the first issue right here. And I do mean this with all sincerity. This is not because you're on the show. I uh really was impressed. I mean, I, I didn't know I knew the art would be great, but you know, I didn't know anything written from you. And I from the first panel, it's very engaging. Thank you. So much. Uh, Everything, they're robots, they're sentient AI robots, but the personalities are very diverse. And it's uh, it really kind of touches upon the different classes of people in real life, societally. And, I mean, one of the characters, I'll let you talk about it, he's not nice. He's, yeah. he's really a jerk. Yeah. And, and then you have the, you know, the noble warrior and, you know, so... Before we get into all that, when, when did you come up with the concept and how did you develop it? What inspired it? Yeah, so I, I had been wanting to try my hand at, an, at writing an original science fiction series for a long time. I grew up on science fiction and reading and you know studying storytelling. And I had this idea about five years ago maybe of what if you had characters that truly were from different classes of society, you know, that would never normally be in the same room, but they're forced to protect each other to survive. So I came up with this archetype of like, you would have a like a very noble warrior from deep space. Then you would have an addict who was like a laborer. He was like the look, look down upon class. Then you would have the smartest engineer level, like this affluent guy, but he's the worst personality. He's the asshole. And then you have <laughs> a very innocent, like a very innocent kid robot who was just kind of thrown in with them. And I thought of just like what you know what that di that dynamic would be like. You know, like what that the four of them would be linked together. So what the kill lock is, is a punishment that this society of robots has, where if one of you dies, all four of you die. So your punishment is having to protect people you wouldn't normally care about to survive. And I thought that was a really interesting premise, hopefully. And then it was just, um, just a matter of kind of fleshing out like who these people were. It's like, how do you make 
in, like intentionally the the psychopath character like the artisan he's a very nasty piece of work but it's like but i want by the end of the series that people understand more of where he's coming from and they there's more depth to that character so but that was kind of the genesis of the the story but there's a lot to play with that. I mean, not only are you developing the characters and the chemistry that builds between them or the lack of chemistry, you know, the adversity that they form, but just even the fact that you think about it, you have this noble warrior who has to defend someone that he may think doesn't deserve to be defended. And he's going against his code because, you know, they're all, like you said, the kill off, they're all to protect each other. And he may not care if he dies. He may not care if that bad person dies, but there's two other people to consider. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I wanted that um, there to be a constant sort of friction between them as they go forward that there's not just good ones and bad ones. They all have these different shades. So the the robot that's the jerk, he's kind of in a lot of ways the most useful one because he's the smartest, he's the most advanced. And then the one that's kind of a good hearted laborer has this addiction that really causes problems where he initially is the protector of this kind of kid robot. But when the addiction takes over, it's a different side of him. He sort of becomes a, a threat as well. So I, li I like the kind of gray area of that, of, you know, these characters navigating a galaxy and there's not just one you can point to as like, that's the hero. So you came up with the concept. Uh, how long did it take for you from conception to production of the, the product, you know, to the, the project? Uh, was it finished? And did you finish it before you pitched it to IDW or did you pitch it first? Yeah, I, I did. I'm um, so... Um, I think five years ago, I started coming up with the concept and maybe started drawing it like three years ago, three or four years ago, and just chipping away at it around all my other work. Because one, I had no idea if anyone would even like this story. And it was also like, you know, with creator and stuff, unless you have a special deal, you don't get paid till it comes out. So you really have to do it around the other stuff. But I, but I loved working on it so much that it really was my kind of my, my happy place the last few years of, of professionally working on this stuff. And then, um, I actually pitched it to IDW after it was finished. So I was like, here's six issues. They're all done. I paid to have it lettered by Tom Long, who we worked together on Transformers. So it was all lettered and totally finished when I pitched it to them. So, and then there was still no guarantee that it was going to get like greenlit by them. Like my backup plan was like, oh, you know, comicsology, like I could put it up there. But, but I was very happy that IDW gave it a green light. How did the pitch go? I mean, were you nervous? And then how did you go about it? And did they say yes right away? Did they have to think about it? Or well, When you pitch a comic, you don't, it's not like you sit in the room while you pitch a movie, you send them art samples and you send them like what the series is gonna be. And then you wait to hear back. In the case of IDW, that he, even though I'd worked with them for like 10 years, it wasn't like a slam dunk. Like they were like, oh, we'll publish anything. They have a creator owned committee and there's plenty of people on that committee that I didn't, I've never met. So it wasn't like I had any kind of inside, you know, friend. And just thankfully, they told me that every single person on the committee wanted to green light it, which was a blast. Cause that was the first like validation I got and it wasn't a stupid idea. So. <laughs> were, you, like, were, you, were you worried and nervous? How long did it take them to come back to you? I was, yeah. Cause I was like, I thought any day I was like, are you just gonna, like sometimes in comics too, it's like when you first submit things, when I was younger, you would submit things, never hear back. You just wouldn't get an email back. Right. So now I was like, I, I didn't think that would happen cause we know each other, but Still, I was like, I thought, you know, bad news could come any day or, or the concept, like, even when I first pitched this idea to people, just my friends, it's a, I've always felt these series is much easier to read than it is to pitch. I think like what you were saying, like how human the characters are, I think when you read it, it, it comes across, but when you pitch, like it's an R rated Pixar movie about the death penalty, it's like, that sounds a little weirder than when you read it, but. Well, I have to say opening the book, like I said, I mentioned the first panel before, it had an actually an epic feel to it. Visually, it's it's very attractive. Oh, thank you. And and just right off the bat, the edgy dialogue starts. I mean, right off the bat, you you, you the pacing is great in the first issue, and I look forward to the other five. Nice. But, but right off the bat, in a proper pacing of the story, you go right into some edgy dialogue. It gets right into the point of it, but it never felt rushed, and it didn't feel like it was dragging, and you felt like right away you were starting to connect and get the characters, which I have to tell you, as a guy that's always been an artist, I mean, I was really impressed with your your writing right off the bat, like your first project. Thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate it. Like I, I had, it's been really flattering to see it getting a nice response because I had no idea if people would like the characters or if the artist especially is kind of a really rough character. I didn't know in 2020 if he would resonate or if he would really offend people. He's, 
he's meant to be that way. Like he's meant to be a contrast to the characters that have more of a heart. But but yeah, I was, I was a little yeah. bit. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, you broke up a little, but we we got your audio, but your video is a little from just. On. Okay. Oh, there you go. You're back. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, good. Yeah. No. So I was just saying that. Um. Yeah. Like I I had no idea how people would think of the writing or the story, but it's been one of the most rewarding things in my life to see it sort of embraced. So. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for reading it. Yeah. So you go from the stress of oh god, I hope they accept this pitch and don't laugh me out of the room. Yeah. To the, to the stress of, oh crap, it's going to hit stores. Is anybody going to buy this or am I going to fall flat on my face financially and IDW is never going to listen to me again? And then, and then even, and then it, it, the panic never stops because when the first couple issues came out and thankfully got really nice reviews, then you worry, am I going to lose people along the way? Are they not going to like the ending? It's like, right. <laughs> it never ends. I mean, now that the series is over and thankfully it's gotten a nice, like nice reviews, I can breathe easy, but then I'm like, what if people hate the next project I do? So <laughs> there's never, yeah, there you know, never ends. I think that's a good thing though, because if you yeah. feel comfortable with what you're doing, you don't grow. You know, yeah. I mean, if, if you got to be a little on edge to give your best, I think, and, yeah. and it also shows a humbleness, which I think is important. That's, you know? that's so, I hope so. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. And I mean, think about it. If you feel there's no room to improve, you're never going to improve. If you feel all right, this was great, but I want to really push it, push the envelope and go further. That's when you really start to excel and stand out. And where the sequel, it can be better than the original, like Empire Strikes Back, right? Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, that's have, yeah, that's 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 well said. Yeah. Do you have plans for a, a second mini series of it, or do you want to see if you can make it an ongoing series? I, I do have an idea for what a follow up would be. Like I, um, my idea with how the first six end is that it would be if it was only these six, that it would be a satisfying ending. But if people liked it, I had an idea of where the story could go. Um, I, I have been working during quarantine about writing what the next one would be, which has been really nice. I don't know if that's the next thing I'm going to do because I have some other projects in the works, but but I really grew to like love these characters and would love to continue the, the story. Now, again, they're, they're artificial intelligence, they're robots. Uh, what made you decide to go with robots as opposed to humans? Was it the artistic style of yours or you just... You wanted to be able to. Oh, we lost you. Oh, there you go. We're back. Okay. We lost okay. you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, that's all right. It's not your fault. Um, <laughs> so, w was the choice to use robots with you know sentience and, and human emotion because of your art style? Because you just want to challenge yourself as far as making it you know this artificial intelligence, this believable, relatable character? What made you go with that? I think it was two things. I think science fiction has always been really good at being a metaphor for the real world issues. So I think, you know, dealing with topics like addiction and being a soldier, like, you know, I think that stuff is much easier to digest or, or can be much more enjoyable if science fiction, you know, puts it just a little bit beyond. Like Star Trek was always really good at that, where, you know, certain alien races would, they would be a substitute for something on Earth. So they could right. talk about it in a more objective way. And I thought the kill lock, like there's some things like the artisan character, I think he's much more entertaining being a robot. If it was a human being saying all that stuff, it becomes a lot more of a rougher story, you know? Um, and then also, yeah, I think it played to my strengths more to do it science fiction. Cause I, I love, I love robots and that, that kind of world I the environments are more suited to me that way too. Well, again, reading it, I, it, you know, after a while you get submerged because your writing was done so well that it, you didn't even like, like, oh, these are robots. It was, oh, well, oh you, know, you, just, you throw them as people, you know? Thank you. So, yeah, that, that, that was something that was really nice in the reviews where a lot of people were saying it was one of the most kind of human stories that they'd, that they'd read. And I, that, that meant a lot to me because, like, I really cared about those characters and I hope they would connect with people. Now, again, unfortunately, I haven't read two through six yet because of, you of know, COVID and everything. But Sure. Um, without giving any spoilers away, do you delve more not just into their character, but the whole societal class issues, or is that was just a template for their personality? So that's a theme that continues on the sort of prejudices that they have toward one another and where they where they stand. You get a little bit more information about each character as the story goes. Like by the end, you get a flashback for each of them of what what they had done to get sentenced in the first place. I never with these first six, I never wanted to get bogged down too much into the rules of like their society. I wanted to keep it a pretty, pretty easy to digest story. If I do a follow up, I think that'll get more into that about how their society functions and kind of the mythology of it. But for this initial one, I wanted the archetypes to be very clear. Like here's the soldier. This is the drinker. This is the jerk. Who's the, you know, the most 
smart, the most elite member of the other group, and then the innocent kid. I wanted it to be that that kind of cut and dry, and then build out around them. Like they go to bars, they go to a casino planet, they they go to places that were like familiar to us, even though it's a weird sci fi environment. So, what were the um, influences on this world you created? Here. So I'm about to go into coloring now. Wow. But yeah. So um, yeah, influences like definitely, definitely Blade Runner was a huge one. Like the lighting of Blade Runner. I can see that. I mean, even like the character of the Wraith, who's like this deep space soldier, he's sort of an Optimus Prime kind of extension. The idea of if you'd been fighting a war for like 4 million years, what would that do to you? What would, what, what would it turn you into? Cause like Optimus Prime's kind of maintained a lot of his humanity and this Ray character does too, but he's a little bit more of a brutal kind of crusader. So it, there, there is some of that. I mean, I think like, I don't think there's just one influence. I think it's kind of an influence to everything I like put together. Okay. I definitely see the Blade Runner uh, yeah. influence in there, even in just the imagery. So of, yeah. the four, of the four main characters, is there one that kind of you connect to the most or your, your favorite or you like? I think of the four of them, I like the the Wraith and the Artisan are my two my two most favorite, where I think the, the most comic, dynamic. Thanks, thanks. They also have the the least human faces, which is kind of interesting. But um they're they're in the story, they're the most important. And then I also like my the way I feel about them is that is that way too, where I think like they're a great contrast where the artisan speaks very much like a normal human does today. He swears, he you know, he makes jokes, he's sarcastic. And then the Wraith is a completely serious, like, space crusader who's religious. I mean, it's like there's a – I like that contrast a lot. That They almost feel like they should be in two different stories, but they're punishment like through them together. So I think that that, that dynamic I like a lot. Uh, Gallo asked another question. What sci-fi novel would you like to adapt? Oh, great question. Huh. God, that's a great question. Um, man, there was one I read – I get confused. There's – the Forever War, I can't, there's a Forever when there's another one that I read that I loved, where was it, it was the concept of going into deep space and not aging. It's been, do you remember, I read them years ago, but it had a, a big impact on me. A movie about deep, I don't know. I don't remember, I gotta, I gotta get back to you. That's, that's a question I should have an immediate answer for. But the problem is a lot of the best stuff has been adapted already. It's kind of hard to find, find something that hasn't already been made. So this question hopefully isn't too controversial, but you come up with this story. How do you as a writer not throw in your social or political commentary in there? Like how do you just tell the story and not let your own personal feelings develop these characters as opposed to trying to come from those different class perspectives? Because I'm sure you don't relate to each class. Sure. And, and I don't mean this as a knock, but a lot of writers – you can tell when they're writing, they're coming from their specific point of view um, where you're – this story I think was so refreshing because it really just was this, a story for the sake of a, sor of a story. You know, there was no yeah. agenda. There was no message being sent. It wasn't, oh, Libio feels this way is what he's telling me. It was this is the story. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. That actually – that kind of relates to one of the questions someone asked earlier about what I think could be different in comics right now. I think – Comics and movies, I think sometimes it is frustrating when you see so much of what the person who made it, what they believe. I think with the Killock, what I liked about it was because the four characters are so different, they could all express their thoughts. And since I'm writing all of them, my hope is that you don't really know where I stand on these issues, that it's really just, you know, those characters. Like, I think when you put like a very noble soldier next to a, a, a drunk who lets a child get in danger, I think like my hope is that they really feel like characters and it's not, it's not preaching something, you know, like, I think if the killer has any message at all, it's like, you know, protect, protect a child who's in danger. That's probably the biggest theme that's out in the open. But beyond that, I think my hope is that the, the grayness of it would be, would be interesting. And, it, and there'd be nothing preachy about it. Like people have asked me if it's like, if it's my commentary on the death penalty and it, it really isn't, that didn't even occur to me. I just thought it was a really interesting concept and the notion that, instead of just shooting these these robots, their society views it like like putting someone life in prison. Like this is a more merciful punishment. And and I, I'm not even commenting on stuff on earth. I just think that's a really, that's an interesting subject to look at. And see, this thing as a reader, I didn't take it. I didn't even think that either because of the way you presented it. It didn't have any bias in the way you presented it. It just seemed like a great theme. And really it was just a plot tool to, like you said in the beginning, to get these four diverse 
characters to have to 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 develop some sort of bond because one dies, you all die. Yeah. So I, I really, I mean, I, I don't mean to push this home, um, but I really was impressed with it. And it, it was refreshing to me. So I really recommend everybody pick up the book. It was very refreshing. It's, of course, visually stunning. The colors alone. I'm, I'm partially colorblind. I have an issue with colors. Oh, really? And that book popped out at me. So oh. it, you're doing something right because. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my wife laughs at me because I, I, she has to dress me or I look like Bobo the Clown. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why? Is that why most of your jams are black and white, or is that a coincidence? No, actually, I, I do all three versions. If you, sure. I'll, I'll try to tip it a little. If you look in the corner there, oh, yeah, sorry, you did. Yeah. okay. I do the pencils, the inks, oh. and then I do the color. I've only seen the ones I've done. I think I've only seen up to the ink stage. Yeah, you know, um, one day when we're obviously not doing this, I would be happy to show you the. I'll send you pics of the, yeah. the ones that you've drawn on that were inked and then colored. Interesting. Like, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. The the one that you did Cameron Hodge on right now is is in the process of being colored. So I'm excited yeah, nice. to see that. And I have the colored Alpha Flight one uh, and the uh, X Factor and the X Caliber. So you'll you'll right. I'll show I'll send them to you. Yeah. My my heart goes out to the colorists on those too because that's I I know from being in that position many times when you have to color a big group shot, getting the colors the key together like Transformers. This happens to us all the time. It's like. It looks like Skittles got got thrown on the page sometimes. It's like a yellow robot next to a green robot and a red one. It's like it's amazing. I mean, like it, it it's really hard to balance those colors. Yeah, I actually use some top colorists in the in the company in the in the industry, and they do a fantastic mm -hmm. job. So that's great. Uh, and obviously, I get great artists on there. First, I, I love the pencils. I love to keep the pencils. That's why yeah. I do this, and I like to show the process because. Even though I can't draw, I love the process of art. I love what you guys do. I mean, it's one of the reasons I'm doing this show. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. I like I said, the, just between anatomy and light sourcing, and you know, people don't even realize too. It's not just like anatomy, but proximal and distal and angles. Like the way you're drawing that um, Optimus Prime right now, his the angle of his head, the way he's looking. You know, that's mm. that's just to me. That's that's really phenomenal to be able to see people do that. You know. No, and, I know, and I know faces and hands are really difficult. So. Well, it's it's funny to me because Optimus, I, he, I feel very comfortable with him. But if this was a human head in the same position, it would be much harder for me. Like, even though it's the same basic, you know, rough shape, it's like, yeah, I'm much more comfortable with the robots. Are you challenging yourself, like, privately? You say you're going to be working on some human books. Uh, are you challenging yourself with those different positions and stuff? Or Yeah, like, I've always, ever since I was in art school, I've always loved doing figure drawing from life with models, you know? And I really enjoy doing that, where you pencil shade someone that's actually in costume. But I think drawing it out of your head is much more challenging to me. I find drawing robots much easier. Um, but, yeah, this new project I'm working on, I can't really talk about it yet, but there's a lot of people involved. And... And that's actually felt really good because I feel like it's better, better humans that I wouldn't have been able to draw a couple of years ago. So that's, that's a good thing to kind of feel. So I know you can't talk about those other projects, but is there like a, a tentative time frame we should keep a lookout? I would say at this point, end of this year, or early next year, there'll be, there'll be news on that. Awesome. If you want to come back on too to promote that, please let me know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And thank you so much for all the support you're giving the artists right now by this, this format. We all really appreciate it. So thank well, you. Well, I, uh, I uh, just love what you guys do. So well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's cool to talk to someone too that um like that we know you're a serious collector. Like your credentials are literally behind you. Like it's it's cool to talk to someone <laughs> that we know really like, lives and breathes this stuff the way that we do. You know, I didn't even think of it that way. My credentials are behind me. Nice. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> but, but you know, I just I didn't think you'd want a background of my board games or my my printer. So, well, is, <laughs> and I'm so true. bad at this that I don't have a green screen to put up my you know my logo mm -hmm. or anything. In a in a COVID world, it's so funny to be able to see this window into people's lives. Like I know when I watch like Stephen Colbert or any host, you like study the books they yeah. have. You know, like you just like you're getting so much more insight into these people. Yeah, but you also know they're smart enough to be putting the angle that you they want oh, yeah, you to yeah. see. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to stack these books I've never read, so I look better. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get to Geraldo's question, speaking of backgrounds, you sure. have the most amazing freaking enterprise I've ever oh. seen. And I swear to you, as much as I am not a thief, uh -huh. if I could ever go, I will take that to the Undiscovered Realm, which will be my house, because I that can, thing is awesome. Let me see. Uh, yeah, right. Over, okay, so it's up there. So when it's down below, this thing is 
probably two feet long at least. And um, it's a custom piece by a model maker named Dave Windham, who's an amazing guy. It's an existing kit that he really heavily modified. So we had him, or I asked for him to put in the battle damage from Wrath of Khan. And I'm just yeah, going oh, so so, nice. yeah, like, so it, it flickers, it glows. It's, it's really, it's my favorite piece I own because it's one of a kind. I mean, it even has, you know, in, in Search for Spock, when they come in to port and you see the burns on the side of the ship and yeah. they're all looking like, oh, my God, what they go through, it's yeah. on there. Oh. Yeah. He, put, he actually had him – we're mixing continuity because it's technically two different enterprises this happens to, but right. the torpedo hit that goes straight through the ship in Star Trek VI that blows all yeah. the way through. I, that's one of the coolest things I've ever seen in a movie. So I had him put that in. So he yeah. actually saw it through, and you can see a little flickering inside. It's amazing. The scale is, is amazing. Yeah, if, if you go check out Levio, I mean, this was posted a few months ago, but if you go check out his post, he has a picture, a pictures of it. It's, it's, it is phenomenal. Oh. I love it. So, you. you know, talking about Star Trek, um, do you have a preference, Star Trek or Star Wars? Uh, you know, how does that work? Because Star Trek, Star Trek has the social themes that seem to go in the kill lock, but. Yeah. You know. I love them both. And actually, funny you mention that because, uh, like, like Star Wars was always my favorite, but I, I loved Star Trek almost as much. Like, like I don't think you have to pick one. I think they're both amazing. But analyzing it now, based on what you just said, the Kill Lock does have some Star Trek stuff, but also the mythological side, the Yoda spiritual side of Star Wars. That's definitely in like the character of the Wraith. That that didn't that didn't even occur to me until you said that. But I can definitely see those influences there now. I think so, that's also why I like it so much because I'm like you. I mean, I do tend to lean more towards Star Wars because I do love the spiritual, but I really enjoy Star Trek too. So yeah, I think yeah. Like, they're both amazing. Like I, I get off on the uh, both the design of the vehicles too. Like in Star Wars, I love how sometimes the practicality goes out the window of like, why would you make a giant walker that looks like a camel because it looks amazing? <laughs> but then, but then also in Star Trek, I love how meticulous it is. Like. The enterprises are literally named in alphabetical order. I love, I love the notion that that universe is, feels so built and like real, you know. But I agree. Yeah, that's another commission I want to get from you: an enterprise versus a star destroyer. Uh, that would be interesting. Yeah. Who do you well, think what is that the USS Vengeance is a bigger ship that was from the the J.J. Abrams redos? Oh, big, yeah. In his second one, it's called the Vengeance, I think. That's it's the a much black enterprise, right? The black evil yeah. one. Yeah. That, that's much larger. That would be interesting to see up against the Star Destroyer. Yeah, no, especially no one's really, I mean, I'm sure someone has, but what's stronger? Like a shields on the Enterprise or shields on a Star Destroyer? Well, being that ships fly right into the bridge of a Star Destroyer and blow it up, I think maybe Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the shields are down at that point. If, I, if, I'm, if we're nerding out hardcore, I think they lower the shields first. But who knows? That would, I don't even know what the scale is. How big is the Enterprise compared to a Star Destroyer? I know I've seen a chart. Uh, I, yeah, I just saw a chart, and it's actually considerably smaller than a Star Destroyer. That's why I was saying the Vengeance is more its size. I think the Vengeance is scale to the Star Destroyer. So if you take the Enterprise to the Vengeance in the movie, you would see the scale. Oh. I, yeah. I, saw, I saw this thing that made me laugh about um, Rise of Skywalker, the fleet that comes out. You know, Someone did the math about how many people it would take to power that fleet, and they said that – they said that the average Star Destroyer has like 40,000 people working on it. And they said that if you cut that number in half, so every Star Destroyer has 20,000 people, it would still be like 8 million people are piloting those ships right now. Like, it's like some insane number that doesn't make any sense. Like, <laughs> Well, yeah. that's kind of like when you're watching a Hulk movie and uh, someone falls from a first story and you go, oh, come on, they wouldn't live. It's not the yeah. big green monster that's not realistic, but the fact that the person fell from the first floor and didn't die is what's is really what got you going, you know? <laughs> I know. It is really funny. <laughs> uh, so Geraldo asks, what's the most difficult part for you in creator owner in a creator owner book to produce itself, to pitch it to a company, or to engage the audience? Which was the most difficult part? Huh. That's a really interesting question. I think they all have their challenges. Um, producing it takes a while if you're doing it around other things. So you're basically your nights, your weekends. So that can be, a, that can be a lot. It can take a long time, you know? Um, and then pitching it, pitching it's hard too, because there was people I talked to in the beginning, I think I mentioned where, you know, I don't think they quite understood, like even friends, like they, they were like, Oh, I guess, but you know, but I think when they read the book, it makes a lot more sense. And then engaging an audience. I mean, that one really is up to, to whatever the audience thinks. I think, uh, 
thank you. It's like cross the fingers and pray. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really felt that way. I was like, oh my God, I have no clue if people are gonna like this at all. And thankfully it's gotten like a really, really like more favorable response than I even expected, which has been great. Like people were sending me fan art after, right after the first issue came out, which yeah, was amazing. That. that was really cool. Like, um, I, I was blown away by that because, you know, these characters weren't in their lives a week ago and then they're out there and now they exist for other people to draw. And that's, that's pretty amazing. Cause that, that meant a lot to me personally. Cause I remember how I did that. I would draw fan art of characters that I liked. So that, that circle was cool. And well, here, but the finished Optimus. So. Wow. Look at that. So That's beautiful. Thanks. Are you, um, is that up for sale at some point? You know, sure. after yeah, I can. yeah, I can. Yeah. It can be up for sale. If someone wants to, you can uh, send me a message on Instagram or Twitter. Just leave your Remindelli or leave your Remindelli art at yahoo.com. I do lots of commissions for people. So, yeah, hit me up. Yeah, I got to tell you, uh, just everybody, as you've heard me say, I've gotten tons of pencil art from him on my jams. So, uh, you cannot go wrong with him for commission. Thank you, man. And, uh, Steve asked, I know Levio has a degree in art. What is his opinion on the importance of art schools today as far as getting into these industries, especially in the digital media age? That's another great question. A really, really good question because, you know, when I went to school, it was definitely a different world. Um, like the, the fact that quite honestly, you could learn pretty much all the technical skills I learned in grad school off YouTube for free right now. Like literally for free. There's, you know, hours of people watching people draw lectures, all that stuff is free. Now the trade off with that is going to school to learn the skills is only half of the reason you go to school. The other half is, it's the networking side where you are talking to professors that are actively in the industry and also your peers. You know, when you go out into the real world, it's really helpful to have people that you know personally because they'll help you get a job or they might need someone they hire you. You know, if you, you, in terms of a technical level, you can learn everything you want, everything you need to know online right now. But I don't think anything will beat the experience of the, the networking side. But it's a, it is a good question these days with the cost of it because it can be really expensive to go to school. And in terms of what kind of art you want to do, a degree necessarily doesn't get you anything. If you want to, like I got a master's degree. So if I wanted to, I could teach at a, a, a college level. That's what a master's allows you to do, which is really, as a fallback plan, that's really nice. But if, you're, if your goal is just to draw for a living or to draw comic books, you don't need any kind of degree. But yeah, it's really kind of a, a, per, a personal preference. Like I... um. I was fortunate to go to a school where our teachers were amazing because they were actually they were active professionals. I had a night class with a guy that was an art director at Pixar, so he would be working on Wall-E in the day and come teach mm -hmm. us and, and like tell us what he worked on, and that wow. was invaluable. Like that was like you got to ask someone at Pixar questions that you probably couldn't. You definitely couldn't do just watching a tutorial. You know, you got to have more of a dialogue. So it's really kind of personal preference, I think. I mean. The job market is different than what it used to be. The notion that if you went to college, you went to grad school or master's degree, you'd never have trouble finding work. The world's a little bit different now. You know, that 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 path for a lot of careers is, has changed. Right. I would say it's something to look into. I mean, yeah. I mean, me personally, not that I was asked. I, You know sure. what I do think is important for artists, from my perspective, to learn? Yeah. Marketing and business. A lot of artists, they just want to draw, and I get that. But you're selling yourself, whether it's pitching your creator own thing or selling commissions or selling on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, whatever the case may be. I think it's very invaluable for an artist to be able to manage their own business and be able to market their own business so that they can get to that level. I mean, look at Todd McFarlane for crying out yeah. loud. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, I really think that's valuable. So if anything, you know, keep drawing, keep drawing, but try to learn those aspects. I mean, again, I'm not an artist. But from the, a business person looking at that aspect, I think that would be really valuable. I mean, think about it. You, you, what if you pitched your, you know, if you weren't working for IDW, you didn't have some sort of in, some sort of relationship. Now, I'm sure it was obviously on the merits of your book that you got approved because money is the bottom line no matter who you are. But you have to know how to present that. Yeah. On a business level, you have to understand they, you know, to them, it's about, is this going to make me money? Is this going to sell? Is this going to, you know, push a brand? When you start to understand that side of things, I think it really helps in all these. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I mean. No, I think you're, I think you're totally right. I think to your point also, going to school teaches you deadlines and budgeting your time. 
because that's I'm sure you 100% have stories about because artists are notorious for this that you know you have a commission set up and they're taking a lot a lot longer than they said or they're not writing back to you. I, I know you must have those stories just because everyone does, and I pride myself on I never miss deadlines. I am very communicative, and I and I just hear so many stories from people of like they'll never commission this artist again no matter how good he is because he doesn't make his deadlines. And I think school, you know, school teaches you about that. It teaches you time management. It teaches you the importance of communicating with people. So that's that's definitely a really important skill set. Like, I'm sure you you, I, you don't have to name names. I'm sure you probably know really talented people that you might not commission again because of the experience. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, listen. Uh, yeah. Here's the thing. I'm 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 totally understanding that deadlines are your bread and butter. They come first. Yeah. So. I don't, I don't bother artists. You know, I'll, I'll even wait six months before I follow up and say, Hey, how's it going? You know, I've yeah. had actually people that I don't really know well on Instagram and Facebook go, dude, you seem to have a lot of art and deal with a lot of artists. When do you think is a good time to reach out to them and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, listen, first I'm going to tell you, you got to give them some time. You can't expect it in four weeks. I mean, some guys will do that. They're fast, but are they working on two books? You know, are they working on their own project? They have lives and families, you know, yeah. you got to give them a few months at least. And then when you, when you come yeah. out to them, be nice. Yeah. Be nice. It's like, but I, I get frustrated from the artistic side with, with what the, the commissioner, like the people that commission the art have to deal with where I hear about artists who just, you know, they'll be years late on a commission. They spent the well, money, there, you know, there, there is the extreme where people have a right to be upset. I'm not even yeah. talking about that. I'm, I'm actually, going on three years on something right now. Yeah, so. right? I mean, yeah, I know my brother, my brother currently has a sketchbook from a pretty famous artist. He gave the sketchbook to that artist about, I think four years ago. And it's a sketchbook that, think about how much more art you could have gotten in that book over four years. Right. So it's not losing the art and the money, it's the time of like, it's really frustrating. Like I really, really dislike that. Well, I'll say this though, the, the, the individual that I'm, oh, it's going on three years, has had a lot of work going on this individual is someone I do really like and respect. So I've been really patient and it hasn't upset me. Yeah. But if it was someone I didn't know, I'd be like, come on. I uh, think, I think the key is communication too. If the, if they're, if the person's writing back to you steadily over three years, I think that's more forgiving. What I get frustrated by is uh, that people have been waiting two years with no email. Like, yeah. you know, there's, there's emails like, and it, it has a ripple effect. I mean, it's like that, that, you know, like the, there's an art community that that reputation gets around. And it's a small community. I mean, it really is a small, and it's funny. And I, again, I'm not naming names, but there are individuals yeah. they get mean and nasty with you when you simply just inquired after five months. And it's like, dude, I'm just asking. I'm not, you know, but yeah. whatever. That's your business practice. It's also like, yeah, it's like you're literally paying them to do what they claim they want to do for a living. So they have no right to get mad. Like, and the and the funny thing is, no other place in earth will you get paid for a service that is not delivered for a year. I mean, I, I don't go to McDonald's and hand them money for number three, and they say, "Come back Tuesday." Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's true. You know what? Actually, my one pet peeve is that I'm going to throw out there. I'm at a con, and I have a couple of jams circulating, and I give you my jam, and. You, I, there's not three people ahead of me. I'm the next guy up. And for some reason, they're holding on to my jam and they're holding on to my jam. I've had people hold it for two days of a four-day con. Not only are you not – I can't get the work that I want done on it now, and I may miss an artist that I'll only see at this show, but you're messing up the other, other artist's schedule as well because they have me slotted for a time, expect me to bring it. Yeah. So that, that is my one pet peeve when I'm doing art or a jam. If you tell me, look, I got four people ahead of you, I understand that. But if I'm next yeah. and you've got it for days, like, come on, man. What are yeah. you doing? I, I totally agree. Yeah. Like, that, that's what I think of a lot, too, with the, it's the lost opportunity of time. Like, I knew a guy who had a sketchbook that, you know, had tons of great art in it, including a sketch by Guillermo del Toro. And another artist lost that book. Oh. So, it doesn't matter what amount of money you get back. You're not going to get another Guillermo del Toro sketch probably. No. So the emotional toll of it. Like I, I was going to ask, has any, have any of your jams ever been damaged over the course of a weekend? 
thankfully no. I hope you didn't just curse me. <laughs> but no, I, 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 I hope I did not. <laughs> I have to say no. Um, everybody's been good, but I will say this though: there are a few times where artists have been a little careless with them out. Like I give them to you in a sleeve, yeah. you know, and they're yeah. they're out and they're drinking coffee over it or whatever. And I'm sitting there trembling, like, you know that this is expensive, right? Because yeah. art is expensive, and I have 11 artists on this. Yeah. You know? you know, and some will be like, hey, just mail it to me. I'm like, no, I don't mail my jams. I do not yeah. mail the, the original pencils. I'll mail, I'll do a digital scan, and you can mail me the ink over the blue lines. You can mail me the, the colored if you have to, but pencils, I do, they're always in person. And that's why there are some artists that now have reps that I can't get them on my jam anymore because you have to go, you have to mail it to the rep and the rep will have it and send it back. Yeah. And I can't just jump to them at a con and have them do it right there at a con. So unfortunately there's some artists I can't get anymore because of that middleman. I will not mail them. Yeah. No way. I'm, I'm actually surprised more original art isn't destroyed at conventions. Like I was drawing someone's sketchbook and it was a giant book, man. It was probably like not quite 18 by 24, but it was, it was close to that. And I was drawing that at my table at a show and I was like, there's people left and right walking by with soda. I'm like, I just feel so nervous holding this. Like yours, 11 by 17 is like a manageable size. Right. But this book was like huge and it, it like all this bright white space to destroy. Like, yeah, it was a little nerve wracking. It, it kills me when you see people come up to look at your art and they're holding a bottle of water or they, or they put it on the table. Like, I know. Yeah. Yeah, that happens a lot. People like put their soda right on your print or right on the your. I want to choke them, and I'm not even the artist. I know. Yeah, it's like. Yeah, you definitely deal with some awful people at conventions and some really nice people too, but some, ugh, yeah. Which leads to my next question. You like how I segue these things? <laughs> well done. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Can you tell me uh, one of the most memorable or interesting convention moments? It could be a fan experience. It could be uh, meeting a celebrity, another artist. It could be something that was just totally off the wall, weird and crazy. Um, yeah, actually, I, I mentioned him earlier, ironically, but one time at San Diego Comic-Con, Guillermo del Toro walked up to my table, which was pretty crazy because, like, he had just finished uh, doing a moderating a panel on Hall H, and he, I could see him down the aisle walking, and he, he, he didn't know me or anything, but he walked right to my table, and he was flipping through the yard, and it was, it was crazy because I'm a huge fan of his, and also behind him was the sea of people taking photos of him. So it was like me trying to be, you know, not be terrified and nervous, but he was really nice. He took my card because he was getting ready to start filming Pacific Rim 2. This is when he was going to direct it. Right. And, and he was like, are you looking, are you looking to do film work? And I was like, yes, I definitely do. Awesome. Yeah. So he didn't end up doing that movie, but, and I'm sure he lost that card, but that would have been, that was still a really cool experience. That would have been great for you to be a concept artist on the Pacific Rim. Yeah, that would have been neat. I've had a couple weird, like <clears throat> Wesley Snipes came up to my table one time. Which is funny. Uh, that was like at a smaller show. I think it was like at like Wonder, like I know, maybe like Long Beach Comic Con. It was like a smaller show, but um, but yeah, that was that was pretty entertaining. Yeah, sometimes like Robert Rodriguez came up to my table one time. Like you, you oh, do, wow. yeah, like San Diego Comic Con artist alley is wild because like you'll just see a huge celebrity walking through, like Jason Momoa or someone will just be walking through, and there's so many people that they kind of get away with a few rows before they get noticed and they take off. But yeah, pretty funny. Yeah. Unless someone like comes up and goes, look, it's Jason Momoa. And they're like, yeah. Oh, and that does happen. Like that, they, they do get recognized a lot. I would imagine. Yeah. Um, just to let everybody know, if I missed any questions in the chat, forgive me, but we'll do a, a short Q&A after we're done talking. So please repost them if I don't see them and we'll be welcome to answer them. Um, I did want to ask you, I ask all the guests this question. Well, huh? actually, you know what? Hold on that. Hold that thought. Okay. Before I ask that question, uh, do you have any tips or advice you would give up and coming artists that are really working hard to try to get in the industry? So you broke up there. Tips for artists trying to get in? Yeah. Any any advice or suggestions as far as helping them, you know, get noticed by publishers? Yeah, I would say uh, social media is really important these days. If you have an Instagram, make sure it's professional. Like, have finished work on there, post regularly, and then don't. Don't mix up your Instagram with your like personal like partying life. If you want to be taken seriously, like have your best work on there, have you know well good comments, descriptions going on. Um, go to convention. Well, normally my advice in a pre-COVID world was go to conventions and set up because you'll never know who's going to walk by. Like the examples I cited are pretty huge people, but I've had plenty of editors walk by and gotten amazing jobs because of that. Um, 
I think it, yeah, I think like that, that's really the key thing is kind of the networking aspect is social media and then, you know, get it, getting your stuff out there. And if you go to a convention, make sure your booth looks good and your portfolio is ready to be flipped through. Cause you never, you never know when an editor is going to come by looking to hire someone. And you would recommend sequential art panels, right? To show you could just tell a story, not just stills because they don't care about stills. They yeah. Sequential, right. Yeah. Because also cover art is tend to be viewed as the much more a level, like, Adam Hughes, the people that don't want to do sequentials, they do their covers, right? So if you want work, like being able to do sequentials is much better. Like you can do covers also, but yeah, have cover samples, make sure they're finished. Like one thing you see a lot of is people have unfinished art in their portfolio and that's a real bad, like it just sends a signal that you didn't care enough to finish this thing, which is- When you want to show you could do a deadline, that's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. I totally yeah. understand that. Yeah. So what I, what I ask all guests as, as my last question is if you could go back and talk to Livio when you, right before you were getting in the industry or just getting in, what advice or wisdom would you bestow upon that Livio? Hmm. That's a good, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's tough. I'm so close to it. Like I know, I know what I could tell the younger version of myself that was just starting off like drawing. Um, one of that, one of one big thing I would say to that and for young artists out there is, you know, if, if you're taking art classes now and you want to draw Batman, but you know, a teacher's telling you to draw like a still life, like draw these you know blankets, learning that stuff will teach you to draw a better Batman. You know, look at, look at the way blankets fold. And that'll teach you how Batman's cape operates. Like all the stuff that I was sort of bored by a little bit growing up. I was like, man, that, that was the fundamentals that, you know, learning how to shade a piece of metal will help you with Optimus Prime later. Um, me in the industry, I don't know, because I've only been in the industry, I guess, I guess like 10 years now on Transformers. I don't know. I, that's, a good, that's a really good question. I mean, I, 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 I heard great advice from people, which was always be kind. You never know. Like we talk about, it's a small, it's a small circle of people out there. So be easy to work with, be polite, because that, that will get around, you know? So, yeah. Well, you've always been, you've always been nice to me. You were pretty cool with me. Oh, thank you. I, I, I know that you asked somebody if my show was worth going to. <laughs> well, I asked somebody? You asked somebody if my show was, you know, is, is he not right, guys? Is a good show to go to? I know you asked, and I expect what? that question. Yeah, a few oh. years ago. Oh, huh. I wonder what I, but I already knew you at that point, right? You knew me, but I mean, it's not like we break bread, so you only oh. know me as far as we talk across the table. So oh, okay. I don't yeah, it was a totally understandable question. Oh, um, yeah. I was, I was going to say, like, is he a good guy? I already know you're a good guy. I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to phrase it like, how was the show experience? Like, because it's, I wish you were closer to me. For me, that you're you're in the East Coast. That's a I long know. Time. Yeah. Well, just letting you know, I'm going to be a two-day show next time we come around. So I would love to, to have I, you. Know, I would, do you do it in October normally, or when do you do it? Uh, well, I was doing it every six months, but uh, I'm mm -hmm. just going annually now, and I'm going to try – Again, it, venues matter and all other shows, but I'm going to try for like beginning of April to start off the season. Okay. See, in New York, in New York, it's tough to do a winter show because one snowfall and we're done. Yeah, I so, think I did, I did New York Comic Con. I think in when it was in February one year, and that was like freezing. Like, was it February? Uh, me? No. No, no. Well, one of the main oh. New York ones was it New, New York? Uh, Comic -Con? Wasn't no, it February one year? C2E2 and Emerald City do that, but um, no, no. Big Apple Con, did you ever do the Big Apple Con? I haven't done Big Apple, but I remember New York Comic Con. This is probably like, God, like seven years ago, more more than that. They used to have it in like February, I think, and I remember it being like freezing. Right. Like, well, February is freezing. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and well, you can, you know, in New York, you never know, you get a two foot downfall and that's it, it's over. Yeah. What do so, you think, if you were a betting man, what do you think is the first convention that's going to return? I, look, I, I know people are going to think I'm nuts, but yeah. I'm still not convinced New York Comic Con is going to cancel, and I'm going to tell you why. Really? This city and state needs revenue badly, so I don't think they're going to be forced to shut down unless things really get out of hand. Yeah. And I can't see Reed Pop throwing away all that money if they're not forced by the municipal oh, you know, yeah. to close. I could be totally wrong. It's just an opinion. It's not based on any fact. And the fact that we're in August and they still haven't um, announced a closure or a, a, a virtual, I'm not convinced they're closing yet. But I'm not. I'm not also saying I guarantee that they're gonna go. 
So I think New York Con is possibly still going to be the, the first big show that we're able to go to. But if that does cancel, uh, I honestly think what is it, Emerald City in March might be the first one that you can return to. Yeah. I do kind of feel that way that right now I think I'm hopeful that Emerald City will be the first one. I mean, well, I would love New York if it's safe, but but I do think Emerald City is probably the next one on the horizon. Like there's right now there's um there's one I go to every year in Japan that they just moved it to December, but I don't you even know. You went to that one, didn't you? You were you were you were there, weren't you? Yeah, I was there last year. I was there two years in a row, and I love I love that convention. It's amazing, but I don't even think I'd be allowed to go this year because I'm an American and I don't think we're allowed into Japan. Like I don't think so either. Yeah. So. I don't know. so. Well, I mean, hopefully, you know, things get under control. We get to cons again because mm -hmm. I personally, uh, I think as much as virtual cons are, you know, they are providing some sort of service for somebody. Uh, yeah. Nothing beats the energy. Like we were talking about this before the show. Nothing beats the energy and the interaction of meeting the artist across the table, meeting the actor, meeting, you know, or just the energy of people around you and the, yeah. you know, all the personalities and just the life that's all around you. You, you know, you, you don't get that sitting on your couch looking at a screen. Yeah. Yeah. I think we were talking about a little bit earlier that, um, you know, the panels are very nice, but it's still a different experience than being in the same room with the celebrities that when you watch a panel online, it, it is really cool. They, they're definitely doing some really cool content, but it's still not the same energy of being in Hall H and seeing the giant reveals of panel, like like trailers and footage and stuff. There, There is something missing, but. Yeah, exactly. And even just getting that piece of art handed to you across the table or watching yeah. you draw it, you know? I yeah. mean, live feeds on Instagram are fantastic. I love them with artists, but to be yeah. able to stand there and watch an artist draw, and the way you guys are able to talk with us while you're drawing is pretty cool. Yeah, the the energy of Artist Alley is really cool. Like when you get to like a New York Comic Con, like that, the vibe of that place is is really cool. Like it, you feel like pumped up to be there. Like even though it's it's exhausting work over you know that that many days, but but there's something about it that's really really enjoyable. Sid put this up. Conventions will be what I'll miss the most from here. She just graduated from the Kubert School again. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal, phenomenal arts. I really love her work. Oh, very kind of person. Yeah. And she moved back to Chile. So uh, oh. she's out of the States right now. Oh. Yeah. So, conventions, I think for me, I agree with what she said that conventions are probably the biggest loss for me personally with COVID. Is like, thankfully, everyone in my life is safe and no one's gotten ill. But right. yeah, losing that was like the biggest, the biggest hit to me. Uh, Joe Tolliver had said, and I agree with this 1000%, trying to find a way to make a virtual artist alley is definitely a challenge. And, you know, and, yeah. You know, playing on what Joe was saying, also for like even for this show, like some artists, I talk to them, they want to draw live, some just want to be interviewed, some want to do live sales. Yeah. So there's different formats, and you you have to manage that depending on your online show. You know, how is that going to work? And then there's technical stuff, like we were going to try to have you where we could see what you were drawing live while we talk, but it doesn't always work out, and. Uh, so uh, Joe, you're right, man. It's it's not easy. It's not yeah. easy. Yeah, we tried to do a technical thing earlier of getting the camera on me as I was drawing up in this prime and like we were getting some audio feedback that we couldn't solve. So yeah, it's a shame, you know, like the technology on these has been like on some zoom works perfectly, some of these, and then some some is like it's harder. So well, unfortunately, I'm not tech savvy. Not I, yeah, I'm I'm bad. I'm really bad. It's amazing I've gotten this far with this show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This format's really cool, though. I've never used this this exact like software before. Uh, Streamyard's good. You can do up to ten people at a time, and it's it's just easy to get you in and out. But I'm yeah. they're probably better platforms. But I'm I'm a baby crawling right now, so you know, <laughs> let's let's just go with it until you know, it gets better. I have to get on YouTube and other things. But uh, uh, yeah. Joe actually uh, has a, a YouTube channel. If you want to put it in the the chat, Joe, go right ahead. He's much more tech savvy than me. His show looks much more professional. So go check out Joe Tolliver's um, show. So anyway, uh, does anybody have any questions for the Q&A part for Livio before we depart? Also, to remind you that Optimus Prime is for sale. If you're interested, yeah. please contact him on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, if you don't want that, you can get something else as well. I will tell you right now. 
for the quality work you get. Levio is one of the very fair priced artists out there. Yeah, thank uh, you. You definitely get your bang for your buck. And thank I'm you. not I'm not saying that because he's a guest. I'm saying that because it's the truth. If it yeah. wasn't the truth, I just wouldn't offer that information. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank so you. I'm, I'm very it. serious about that. Yeah, thank um, you. <laughs> uh, anybody else uh, with anything to ask? And by the way, Joe said, yeah, put a mic on the camera for the art. So. Yeah, next time. Oh, no, Joe, don't be silly. Not a problem <laughs> at all. Uh, and be sure to put whatever links you want in the chat, buddy. Um, so, look, I'm thankful that you came on. I, it was good to talk to you. Uh, I remember at Amazing Las Vegas, I got to actually – stay and talk with you for a while i think that's where we got to know each other a little better yeah um you know more than just okay that's the guy that always comes for art but you know you got to know phil i got to know Livio a little bit yeah um and you know if you're ever able to make it to my show i'd love to go out and you know have dinner and hang out and that would be amazing maybe, yeah yeah maybe eddie nunez and all of them will come to i so. would love that yeah we were i text nunez all the time that yeah we miss each other yeah yeah, I know you guys are buddies. You got to sit next to each other in New York Con last year, at least. Yeah, we're usually we usually next to each other quite a few shows. We won't, we don't know why that happens. Like I like Emerald City, we're almost always next to each other. Like oh really? Yeah, sometimes you can fill out the form who you prefer to be next to. But I, we, we were Wildstorm family too. Eddie and I both were working for Jim, so I've known him a long time. But yeah, but yeah, we should yeah. that would be really cool. If we could both come to your show. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it'll be two days, so hopefully it'll be much more worth the time. And, you know, we'll talk. Of course, you know, you'll you be a guest. So. Oh, thank you so much. That would be great. Um, thank you again, everybody. The Kill Lock. The Kill Lock is his creator-owned series. I'm going to tell you now, I'm not just saying this. I was very impressed with his writing, the characterization, the pacing of it so far. And it's a six-issue series. It's out in local comic shops. If your comic shop, for whatever reason, doesn't have it in stock or is not carrying it, ask them to. You will not be disappointed. It's a good price point. It's quality art. The color is amazing. The writing is really good. Um, and we need to support the good, humble artists out there as well, like Livio. Oh, and keep an eye out for his projects that he can't talk about now. But, you know, he said possibly end of year, beginning of next year. Follow his pages. Mm -hmm. Commission his work. Keep an eye out for his projects. You will not be disappointed. When you see him at a show, say hi to him. All right? Thank you. It was great to talk to you. And thank you, for everyone, for watching. I really appreciate it. You too. If you could, just hang up backstage for a minute if sure. it's okay. Yep, totally. Thank you, Leo. Yep. All right. Well, there was, uh, what is this, episode four or five? I don't remember. I'm, I don't even know what I had for breakfast. Thanks, everybody, for coming out uh, and being part of the show. Thanks for the participation. Thanks for the guys that, and gals that are um, supportive. We really hope that this is beneficial to artists and helping them in, you know, crazy times, but also helping fans. You know, we love this medium. We love this industry, and we want to keep it going strong. We want to support local artists. Like I always do shout outs before the show, uh, any other local artists, or even if you're not just an artist, uh, you're in the industry, a comic book dealer, Whatever the case may be, please DM me, Philip Russert, and I'd be happy to give you a shout out before every single show. Having said that, one of our big supporters, and I have to tell you, a phenomenal human being that I've really grown to call friend, Geraldo Borges. Uh, I hope I said that right. If I didn't, I'm Irish, forgive me. Uh, will be our guest in two days on Friday, and he is a Brazilian artist now living in Chile. He has a lot of DC and Marvel work. He's a fantastic human being, just like Livio is, fantastic artist. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to put up a post after the show where we're going to get a census on what you would like Geraldo to draw, draw live during the show Friday. He'll do a digital drawing. That digital drawing will be given away free to whoever Geraldo feels gave the best question. Um, so you can get a free digital sketch from Geraldo on Friday if you tune into the show uh, and you give the best question. Okay, so please check that out Friday, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, we'll have another great guest. Again, thank you to everyone that's participated. I love you guys. I love this community. And again, thank you to Livio for not only being a, an entertaining and fun guest, but just an all-around great guy that I enjoy talking to at cons and get awesome work from him that you really should get work. Check out the Kill Off. Everybody, I leave you with this. Have fun storming the castle.